Welcome to the Commercial Real Estate Show, your source for market intelligence, forecast, and strategies. I'm Michael Ball. Thanks for being with us. We have an incredible show for you today. Our show is called Zoning for Dollars. And what an incredible subject to be talking about today. Do you think about it? There's a lot of demand for new supply and new construction in most U.S. markets. And think about what's popular right now. One of the things that's popular is adaptive reuse, which has some advantages, but also has some challenges with permitting and with zoning. Uh, another use is mixed use is very popular. You think about mixed use today, and in most markets where you're seeing mixed use, these areas haven't seen the type of density and the kind of uses being working together. So you have some other challenges with entitlements there. You, know, you also have redevelopment, right, of existing properties. Maybe there's a mall or a shopping center is being raised. Oftentimes there you have more density. You also have a changing use. So zoning can be very important to have the right knowledge. And think about valuing any type of real estate. You need to know what the highest and best use of the property is. So having good familiarity with zoning and entitlement is key to the real estate business. And we have some experts to help us today. We have Woody Galloway with us. He's a partner with the Galloway Law Group. Woody, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. We also have Brad Hutchins. He's a partner with Wiseman, Nowak, Curry, and Wilco. Brad, thanks for being with us. Thank you so much for having me. And we appreciate having you guys as a sponsor of the show. We've done uh, business with your firm for gosh, I think over 30 years. It's, it's been a great relationship. It's been yeah. our pleasure. Yeah, so uh, thanks for that. And we talked about the importance of zoning, uh, Brad, and and especially today, but uh, you know, you didn't always have zoning back in the day, right? And why is it so important today? Well, you know, the history of zoning and planning is very, uh, very interesting. Pre-World War II, we had uh, cities that were characterized as dense. We had residential, commercial, retail, all in the same neighborhoods. Our streets were set up for pedestrian use. They were set up for horses and carriages. And then after World War II, this new profession came about. It was called planning. Mm -hmm. And we started trying to figure out how to best use, uh, use zoning techniques to make our cities better. Well, what we did was we moved residentials to one area. We moved re retail to another area. We moved commercial to another area thinking that we would be able to widen our streets and open it up for the new thing called automobiles, <laughs> right. which everyone was going to. Um, and what that, what that actually did was cause our, the density in cities to decrease, cities to spread out, cause the use of automobiles to be much more important. Now, where are we today? We have overcrowded, uh, we have overcrowded highways and roads. Um, the automobile has become something that's a bit of a hindrance in us trying to get around. And the millennial generation has popped up. And what do the millennials want? The millennials want high density. The millennials want to live and walk to their cool restaurants, to their cool shops and stores. And so we're, we're back to the area and the idea that density is where it's at, putting neighborhoods, residential and commercial all in the same areas, close to mass transit. Um, and that's brought up a whole new set of difficulties for especially neighborhoods that um, are existing and, and aren't used to high density. Right, so there's a lot of changes going on there, and uh, this increased density. Some people say they want it, and and then some people are, are fighting it. So yeah, zoning can be very important. So how busy are you guys? I would think that that you, you were slow. I, I assume in, in '09 and, and, and '10, and how very about today? Slow for a long period of time, yeah. but now it's crazy. Yeah. Um, now there's definitely a renewed emphasis on planning and zoning. Um, where you've got developers that are wanting to take advantage of the market and go forward with projects that may have been on the shelf for a while because there were a lot of projects that were entitled prior to the recession uh, and around here we had a depression in, in the real estate market but um, so if you were now if you're a developer it was depressing it was very <laughs> depressing um, but now everybody's going forward with projects and there has been somewhat of an alarm in the communities because all of a sudden you've got a lot of projects that are under development and uh, the communities are reacting to that and seeing the density that's going in and worried about traffic and schools and all of those things um, but as Brad said there's a renewed emphasis on bringing people closer to town, uh, a desire for people that are in the exurbs to come close to town because of transit, because of walkability, because of availability of shopping and other things uh, that make those much more desirable areas to live in. 
and the millennials in particular are very, very um, interested in being close to all of those things uh, and will trade sometimes size of house and other things in order to have those amenities close at hand. Are the planning and zoning officials, it seems like the ones I've talked to, are about dense development. They seem to be on top of things. What do you see out there in your practice? See both. Both. Definitely see both. Some jurisdictions embrace density because they want density at the core or close to where they've got the infrastructure to support it. Other jurisdictions aren't yet quite uh, ready to embrace uh, density. And well, how so, are you finding it, Brad, to, to do a, a, a rezoning that's more dense uh, today than, than in the past? Well, you know, it's really uh, interesting, what he, as what he said, that um, density is a hot topic and these, it depends on the jurisdiction as far as whether the density is accepted and whether the rezoning is something that the city welcomes or the city or the county welcomes or not. You know, an interesting thing is, is um, one of the trends that I've seen, especially in, around here, but in other areas of the country, is the creation of new municipalities to bring government more local to the people. Well, when you do that, you have a whole other set of problems in this NIMBY effect, not in my backyard, is intensified. Um, cities have to have landfills. City ha cities have to have jails. Not in my backyard. Uh, right, not in my backyard. <laughs> cities have to have dense developments to support the redevelopment of their inner cities. Mm -hmm their retail shops and commercial shops where people are needed in the area to go shop there. Um, so it really depends on the jurisdiction. Some jurisdictions are very welcoming, but some of these municipalities have been um, set up on a no growth platform. And the neighborhoods that exist there are very much into, I want to keep my area the way it always has been. This was a horse farm area. I want it to remain a horse farm area. This was a place I could go to as a refuge from the inner city. I want it to remain a refuge from the inner city. Well, you know, economics play a part into this. Um, do you want your city and your area to be economically viable in the future? Do you want your tax dollars and tax bases to increase? Or do you, rem do you want to remain where you are in a traveling situation where you can't get to retails and commercials any longer because our roads are just jammed? So there's the, you know, there's the, uh, there's the rub that's going on in, in the zoning practices. Does it take longer to, to rezone in the title today than it did in the past? It really depends on the jurisdiction, I think. I mean, once again, if you have a neighborhood that's in an uproar because uh, someone's trying to, to get a permit to put in a, uh, a, um, a, you know, a funeral home wants to put in an incinerator, um, then you may or may not ever be able to get that done depending on the neighborhood surrounding it and how much of an uproar they give. It's all politics. It comes back to politics. What's the old adage? Politics is local. And, and in no other area is that more true than in zoning. That is definitely the right answer in mm -hmm. terms of what, what we're seeing. We give some, them a gold star? Some, gold star. Two gold stars. <laughs> Two gold stars. And, and some jurisdictions are actually extending mm -hmm. the amount of time it takes to go through the, the uh, entitlement process. Uh, and they're doing it specifically because of reaction to the fact that there are a lot of things going on in that jurisdiction. Contrast that with some other jurisdictions that have redevelopment opportunities and they will facilitate it and, and make it easy for developers to come in, take an old, underutilized, or defunct piece of property and use it uh, for a better use. Yeah. An example of that would be the Porsche plant, um, and Porsche plant, the Porsche headquarters, where, which moved from the northern part of the city to the, really the central core um, of the city and just south of, of that at the airport and took a piece of property that was the GM plant and had to go through all kinds of, or the Ford plant, had and went through all kinds of environmental issues in order to make it reusable. But today, Hapeville, which is the jurisdiction that is closest to that, um, to that uh, facility, although it's in the city of Atlanta, um, it is, really attracting all kinds of other development because somebody took the step, the bold step, to go down and spend a lot of money and relocate a lot of people to go down to an area that was underdeveloped. Yeah, now that's an interesting project. We're short on the break, but that was the uh, Ford uh, plant, right, where they were building Fords. How many acres was that, roughly? Total, total that Porsche is redoing mm -hmm. is 60 acres. Yeah. 
um, but the overall plant was hundreds of acres. Yeah, and they've even put a, a test track there, right? So there is, is that, a test is track. That a special there. zoning. I want to well, drive my car fast. Yeah, no. <laughs> and, it, and it's a test track to actually test what a Porsche can do, as opposed to a speed track where you're actually trying to see how fast you can go. You can go very fast on that track. I've I've done it, but not. It, it's more how it seems. Yeah. Yeah, well, I would do the same thing. I'd be to go Absolutely. As fast as I could. <laughs> right. Well, stay tuned. We're going to have some tips on uh, permitting, on entitlement, and on zoning. Stay with us. I'm Michael Bull. This is the Commercial Real Estate Show. The Commercial Real Estate Show is brought to you in part by your friends at Bull Realty. When your business requires proven performance, visit bullrealty.com or call 800-408-BULL. Welcome back to the Commercial Real Estate Show. I'm Michael Bull. Our topic today is zoning for dollars. We have Woody Galloway here with the Galloway Law Group, and we have Brad Hutchins here with Wiseman, Nowak, Curry, and Wilco. We've talked about the importance of zoning in, in any real estate matters, right? And one of the things that I think is there's some confusion uh, uh, from some of the princi principals that own land and own properties that we talk to or some of the differences. And I know this will be different for for different locations, but what's the difference between a special use permit, a variance, and then just rezoning? Well, it does differ by jurisdiction, mm -hmm. but primarily the hierarchy is rezoning is you're dealing with the actual use of the property. So there generally are a list of permitted uses within a specific zoning district that you can do by right. And then if the jurisdiction has special use permits, which all of them don't, but if they do, that would allow you to do a, uh, a different use within that classification pursuant to a separate set of standards that you have to also get approval for. So that it, it would list out criteria if you do uh, one, two, and three, then you can do that use within the uh, overall zoning category once you get approval from the local government. Variances contrast to that because variances deal with you already are allowed to do the use but you're allowed to do that use with within certain standards and if you want to change those standards like a setback or something like that then you can go before either the main governmental body or a separate board board of appeals uh, for instance and get approval to change or vary the terms of the zoning ordinance that would allow you to vary that setback. Okay, well said. Now, here's an important question. I think my listeners are interesting and interested in this. So let's say that you own a property or you're looking at a property. Uh, we've uh, already discussed how important it is to know about highest and best use and what kind of density can you get there? What kind of uses can you do there? What's some good ways for people to get an indication of what a property might be able to be zoned for? Well, the first thing that they might do before they get a professional involved mm -hmm. is go to their local jurisdiction talk to their planning department, say, this is my property, what can I do under the current uh, zoning classification that it's zoned to today? And what are the possibilities, what's next to it? Look at the land use plan, look at the zoning map. And usually the planners that are in these local jurisdictions are very well versed in the political climate. And that's what we are dealing with when we, you start talking about zoning you start talking about a political environment because the politicians ultimately make the decision and yet they hear from their constituents and make decisions based on what those constituents want to see in their jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. So if they go to uh, zoning and planning and they get some indications, I guess they can look at things there if, if, a, if a use is allowed, if there's a floor to area ratio to figure out how much density or how many units they can build per acre and that sort of thing. Uh, but what if they want to see what they could rezone it for? And, uh, and is there another way to do that? Can they look at the comprehensive development plan? Can they talk to guys like you? Yes, they can look at the comprehensive development plan, but also look at the trends that are going on in the area and find out what uh, might be palatable to the local jurisdiction and the planners and the neighborhoods that surround the area. I mean, a lot of times if you want to rezone um, a specific area for more density or, or whatever the case may be, 
And like Woody said, the planners are going to have a very good uh, feel for what the politics of the area will allow. But one of the things I've also found to be very useful in the past is go sit down with some of the neighborhood associations. Go sit down with um, some of the local leaders um, themselves outside of the planners, some of the city council members or the county commissioners, if they'll talk to you. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and just lay out your plan with them. Be honest with them. Tell them how this would affect everything in your, in your uh, opinion. Um, and what positives and also sometimes what some of the negatives might be from the rezoning. Um, let them get comfortable with you. Let, you. let them understand what you're trying to do and you're not the, uh, the dragon coming in to try to tear down the castle. Um, you'll be surprised at how often just sitting down and talking to people uh, makes a big, big impact in the, in the zoning process. Communication, right? That's correct. Absolutely. And it, a lot of times it depends on how complex the situation is. If you're just an individual property owner, it's one thing. If you're a developer and you're looking to really change something, then you're going to want to have a team of professionals that will look at and evaluate what you're proposing to do and what kind of density that you can get because as this show is entitled, mm -hmm. there's a lot of money involved in rezoning. It's the place where you can increase the value of property the most in the shortest period of time. And you know, to add to that, what he's exactly right, the team of professionals is He very, gets a gold star too. He does. Yeah. He gets three gold oh, stars. Oh, three. Okay. Um, well, good. I only got two. Um, but you know, the team of professionals is very important. And where the attorneys can come in at this point in time is especially if you're starting to get negative reaction to uh, what you want to do with respect to the rezoning and it's a very complex issue. Start looking early on and planning for what you believe will be the litigation that must then ensue. Um, you know, there's a lot of constitutional issues regarding zoning. There's a lot of administrative procedures that have to be, uh, you know, you have to check off in order to get through the zoning process. Have the lawyers involved along the way so you can plan and understand and not at the last minute then, then trying to come up with your ultimate litigation strategy in case it's a necess uh, necessity to do that. And that's a good point. Let's expand on that a little bit. So what kind of team might you need for this process? Well, generally what you're, you're going to have a land use professional. Um, zoning attorney, you're going to have an engineer, you know, depending on what you are ultimately building, an architect, uh, probably a traffic consultant. So, and there's a lot of um, public relations involved in this whole process. And we like, what we'd like to do is to get in before there's any contact with the community to manage that process because it is a an overall strategy we like to to talk to the neighborhood and do that ahead of filing because we want to build a consensus so that we make it easy for the politicians to to vote to allow the development because most of the time you've got something to sell you've got a reason why this developer is wanting to to achieve this rezoning mm -hmm. and you have a rationale that you can build around and develop that strategy, go to the neighbors and develop a, a way where it can be win-win for everybody and then the politicians have an easy time. So how do you pick that uh, attorney? I know one of the things that we get into is we sell a lot of land and sometimes uh, that does involve rezoning and the closing is contingent. Um, and, and one of the things that we ask the, the developer or buyer is, or, or who is doing your rezoning? Who's handling this? Who's managing it? For example, I tried to do a rezoning. I screwed it up. I don't have a personality for it. You know, when somebody comes in and says something stupid uh, in argument with it, I'm like, are you kidding me? You know, I don't know. I, I'm and not it's good. hard not to. So how do you get it somebody is. good? How do you know you get the right person? You really have got to do some investigation to find out where – First of all, where are you, what jurisdiction you're operating in, and who does a lot of work in that jurisdiction? Most of the time, you're going to want somebody that is very, very familiar with that jurisdiction. Other times, we get called into cases where it's too controversial in a specific small town, for example, mm -hmm. and the local lawyers don't want anything to do with it, <laughs> right. and so they bring in somebody uh, from far away so that they don't have the, the same constraints that the local people Is it important have. to know that if they've sued before, would you want to use a lawyer that's never sued? Hold that thought. We'll come back to it. Okay. And we'll have more on rezoning and entitlement tips for you. This is the Commercial Real Estate Show. I'm Michael Bull. Stay with us.
Excelligent, the resource professionals like CCIMs, CBRE, JLL, Colliers, and Bull Realty use for market intelligence. Commercial Search is the site to market and find available properties to buy, sell, or lease all over the country. Visit CommercialSearch.com. Welcome back to the Commercial Real Estate Show. I'm Michael Ball. Today we're talking about zoning, and our show topic is zoning for dollars. We have Woody Galloway here, and we have Brad Hutchins here. They're both uh, lawyers who work on rezoning projects, and they're based in Atlanta. And, and gentlemen, um, how important is it when you are picking a team and you're picking a lawyer that the lawyer has sued for zoning before and you know, one of the things that would seem to me as a as a landowner or a buyer of property if i'm trying to get something zoned do i have an attorney that's kind of getting pushed around and never has sued is that important it's very important especially if your initial reaction from the planners or the community is no um, your ultimate goal, we were talking off the air, and Woody mentioned that the ultimate goal is to try to complete the zoning process without litigation. And sure. that is, I agree with that. Communication, working together, cooper uh, being cooperative, that's perfect. But from the get-go, if you don't have either a zoning lawyer leading the team or a zoning lawyer on your team that's ready and prepared to litigate and has a history of litigating, um, then most times, many times I should say, the local governments won't take you seriously. Mm -hmm. You have to have that hammer in place for the community to know that, you know, this is going to go to court and this is not going to be the end of it and we're going to enforce our rights. Um, you know, um, you hate to go there yeah. um, and because again judges sometimes don't want to make those decisions either. Um, some judges are elected and that can be another set of uh, problems, although I always believe judges remain fair and unbiased. Um, but, you know, it's very important to have that as part of your arsenal. Yeah. Well, it seems interesting because you want someone who has a great personality that uh, can work well with the neighbors and the, and, the, and the politicians and everyone, but you also someone who can lay down the hammer, right? And one of the, go ahead. Sometimes those are different people, too. <laughs> That's okay. right. So yeah, sometimes you have the, the person that is out front that handles the local government, yeah. Uh, application and then some and then the litigators are the people that uh, you bring out when good it's cop bad cop huh? good that's right good <laughs> cop bad cop that's right all right and I want to come back to something you mentioned earlier with precedents you know so how important is precedent set so president so if I not president precedent if I have a property and half a mile down the road, somebody's divided, uh, you know, five acres into 20 homes or townhomes, uh, my zoning won't allow that. Can I use that when I go as an argument when I to get my zoning? You can, but immediacy is very, very important. So, if you are adjacent to something, let's say a commercial use, and you want a commercial use, and you're you're adjacent to the commercial use, you have a better shot at it if you are adjacent to it. But if in your due diligence you've checked and you've seen on their comprehensive land use plan, they've drawn a line in the sand and said, this is where our commercial ends and this is where our residential begins, then you're probably going to be out of luck at least as far as going forward and having an easy time getting what you need. You still can make your arguments and, and still can to try, you can go forward and see what you can have done, but your the precedent is dependent on what what the land use plan says and what the the zoning in the immediate area says. Okay, well that makes sense, and uh, I guess one of the things, what would we need if we were going to come to to a real estate uh, zoning lawyer like yourselves? to make it easy for you to kind of give us a preliminary indication of what you think the chances to, to get a property zoned. If we bring the, the plat, we bring the zoning, we see if we see precedent set, uh, and, and is that the sort of thing we should bring to you so you can kind of look at it and go, eh, we've got an 80% chance or a 20% chance? Or That would certainly help. Yeah. What, we, what we always do is the same thing we discussed earlier, mm -hmm. is get develop all that information. If you've already developed that information, it'll allow in that initial interview mm -hmm. you to get more feedback as to mm -hmm. what we think could happen. And then we would start the process of talking to the staff and then talking to adjacent nearby property owners and or the, 
the um, neighborhood associations in the area, the politicians in the area, that kind of thing. Because you want to win, right? You, Absolutely. You, you don't want to lose these battles. We want happy clients. That's yeah. right. And this relates back to what we were talking about earlier. How important, how do you pick the lawyer mm -hmm. that's going to help you in the process? You know, um, a lot of times if a lawyer is more familiar with an area, they'll understand by looking at what the situation is, whether or not it's going to be something that's going to be accepted by the politicians in the area and the local community. For instance, if you have um, a rezoning that you're looking to take place up in the suburbs of a city, um, maybe even outside the suburbs of a city, it's not necessarily a good idea to bring in the city attorney to the outside suburb area. Um, because sometimes in all areas across the state, um, the, the city folk aren't looked at as being positive in the outside areas. Yeah, I had that experience. We went to, to take a listing, a marketing assignment on some land out way in the suburbs. And my broker I was going with said, look, don't pull up in your fancy car and your cufflinks and your tie. Right. You know, I said, well, look, I've got a dually truck. He said, perfect, bring the cowboy Cadillac. <laughs> 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 That'll be perfect. Well, stay tuned. We'll have some more tips on zoning for dollars. I'm Michael Bull. This is the Commercial Real Estate Show. Stay with us. The Commercial Real Estate Show is brought to you in part by your friends at Bull Realty. When your business requires proven performance, visit bullrealty.com or call 800 408 Bull. Welcome back to the Commercial Real Estate Show. I'm Michael Bull. Our show topic today, zoning for dollars. We have Brad Hutchins and Woody Galloway. They're both zoning lawyers. And gentlemen, one of the questions I have on my mind is strategy of what you ask for. So if uh, you want to build apartments, mixed use, or whatever it is, how do you know exactly what to ask for? Should you ask for a little more than you want? You ask for what you want. Okay. And, but realize that you're probably going to have to compromise at some point. A lot of jurisdictions that we deal with will not take your initial application and then act on it. They're going to uh, require that you go through and deal with neighborhoods and or they themselves will feel the need to try to get you to lower the density. Well, uh, that, that would lead me to the argument of ask more than I want then. If they're going to just do that to look good politically, oh, well, they wanted eight, uh, 800 units. I got them down to 700. <laughs> but how, what developer isn't going to want 800 units? <laughs> so you ask for what you want. Okay. And you're, what you want is probably more than what would, is the baseline that you would do the deal for. Okay. But you would probably want to do the deal even more if you got more units. Okay. So maybe ask for what you want, not what you'd settle for. Correct. Okay. That's, that's a good way to put it. Uh, two more gold stars. <laughs> two more gold stars. <laughs> What about uh, rezoning before you sell your property? So if you are you own some property, you kind of want to know what it's going to be zoned for in case the, your buyer doesn't close. Are there any instances where it makes sense for a property owner to rezone before he picks a buyer? Well, this is a very important question. Um, if you're in the business of commercial development or development period, and you're sophisticated enough to understand what will work in an area, what Will be, will be the cost involved, what will be the realized increase in value of the property for the zoning, then possibly, yes, that makes sense. If you're an average uh, person who owns, for instance, 50 acres of property, um, and there's all kinds of different uses the property could be put for later on, maybe commercial redevelopment, maybe retail, maybe, maybe a subdivision, I would say wait and let your seller uh, drive the, the rezoning, pro I mean, I'm sorry, your buyer. Yeah. Um, drive the rezoning process. But if you're sophisticated, let the seller, you're, you, you drive the zoning process. Assemble a good team um, and make it happen. Right, because the, you, if you do rezone it and you get it set up and then your buyer comes along and say, you know, those lots are a little too small or, you know, I wanted less units or bigger units or whatever, the right? Then you agree to, the to get the zoning or, approved. Or, or a just, problem. Right. Uh, but like you said, if you've got the sophistication, and you want to get the potential uptick in value from the rezoning. If you're sophisticated, connected enough, go ahead. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. What if you're a seller, you don't have that sophistication, okay, and you realize that you may better let a, a buyer developer do it so they know what they want. Well, how do you control that situation so that they don't zone it for something maybe a little odd 
that you can't sell to someone else and then they don't close. Well, con contractually, you need to be very careful. So you need to have a very good real estate lawyer that represents you that understands zoning. And you may want, depending on the size of the transaction, you may want to have your own zoning consultant that can advise you as to the feasibility, as to any conditions that may come up as you go along because you may in fact still own that property after it's zoned because they may choose not to close and then you are stuck with that zoning. So you need to have approval rights potentially of, of whatever conditions are agreed to or whatever site plan is agreed to. Well, you would like to have that, right? Some buyers are, might not like it. They, they may not want to give it to you, right. but it's all a negotiation. So that's right. part of the transaction. Do you ever see the right for uh, a seller to to stop the zoning if they think that, look, this isn't going to go through and I don't want it to you to go through the whole process and not get approved and now I can't rezone for two years or whatever it is? Absolutely. But, okay. Because as you are indicating, mm -hmm. Often there is a waiting period of time. If you are denied, then you may have to wait as the property owner. You may not be able to go back for rezoning for some period of time. So it is important to, to potentially have that right. Now that is even harder to get in a contract. Right. But um, because if, if the buyer has expended a great deal of money in pursuing the rezoning, they and they have a chance then it's in their best interest to go forward and see what they can do uh, and then potentially even if it's a, a negative result consider suing. And, uh, and just to follow up on that the devil I uh, can't emphasize enough the devil is in the details of the contract. Mm -hmm. Um, you've got to make sure you negotiated a good contract and had a good team. That was well, let's ask some specific tips on that. So let's say I'm a seller, uh, a buyer's coming along, and when I add up all the times he could extend and extend and do this and do that to get all his rezoning and all of that. It's a year and a half, two years or something. I want to have in my contract some things that would make him be very diligent on time and give me more control. What are some tips? Well, it's all part of the negotiation um, process of the contract. I think the first tip I could say is make sure that you have a very good broker on your team. Make Thank sure you. that you, yeah, absolutely, <laughs> and and make sure that that broker has a part of his team, mm -hmm. um, a good commercial real estate attorney. If mm -hmm. you're doing commercial mm -hmm. um, purchase, uh, to make sure that 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 person, that transactional attorney, understands the nuances of the market and understands what you are looking for, whether he's representing the buyer or the seller. Um, you know, sometimes in that process, you may have to negotiate a, a higher or a lower price overall for the property. You may oh, have to depending on the zoning de depending results. Depending on the zoning That's results, you may have to you may have to negotiate a higher or a lower uh, earnest money deposit requirement, whether that's wholly refundable, whether it's not, yeah. whether on each extension more earnest money has to be put up. Um, all these types of factors go into okay. and it's all part of the negotiation process. And a quick tip I'll, I'll leave you with is that uh, make some timelines where they have to give deliverables of their surveys, of their plans uh, to extend the contract. Right. Gentlemen, thanks for joining us. Great information. Thanks for being on the show. Stay with us. We'll have more. We'll be right back. This is the Commercial Real Estate Show. The Commercial Real Estate Show is brought to you by Bull Realty, a great place to do business. Excelligent, information for the professionals. And Commercial Search, properties for sale and lease. To access these companies or for additional videos, podcasts, and articles, visit CREshow.com.